Okay, good morning. We've got a lot to need to cover this morning in our study and time together. So let's begin with a word of prayer, orienting ourselves to God the Father, the Holy Spirit, that we glorify His Son. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, how grateful we are for the freedom we have in Christ to glorify Him, grow in His Word. Pray, Father, that all that we do this morning will be glorifying to Jesus Christ. In His precious name we pray. Amen. Okay. First of all, before we go into singing, we're going to sing, but today is tomorrow actually celebration for Memorial Day. I don't think much of that's being done anymore, but there was a day when that was a major part of uh, every life and going to uh, funerals and different things. And think about our own great freedom in this country. We had some great men and women that fought for, gave us the freedom. Of course, we all know George Washington. And we should know George Washington. And then there is Nathaniel Green. Now, I'll tell you why I like Nathaniel Green. He's known as the fighting Quaker. Now, Quakers are not usually fighters. They're usually hiding away from all of that, but not uh, Nathaniel Green. He went on there and became a good fighter. <clears throat> uh, Ken Knox, and uh, one more, just to cover it, was uh, coming out, uh, not even in our area, but uh, it was General uh, De Lafayette, and uh, who was a good fighter with uh, George Washington. We had a lot of wonderful men fighting. And we you all know the politicians, Patrick Henry, these, but these are the men that fought for our freedom. So I'd like to start. Uh, let me just ask, did everybody know to pick up? I gave several different things to, uh, to give out. One is Memorial Day quotes. Anyone not get it? Okay, everybody got those. How about the uh, uh, omniscience of the will of God? Everybody got that? Yes. That's the medicine's quote. Our study. Don't have that one? Who? You. Well, I have. Oh, okay. All right. So <laughs> then the other one, uh, we're going to finish the study on uh, mystery. And we still have some things to cover. So I got to thinking this morning, I thought, I know, I know that they all didn't bring back their uh, uh, lesson for last week. So I, uh, yeah, good. Uh, so what I did, I made a uh, uh, copy of all these that we left on. So we'll have those and start with that. But right now, first of all, Memorial Day. I just picked out some quotes that give you something to think about tonight, today and tomorrow, especially tomorrow. And uh, you have time to go by a uh, funeral ground before a cemetery ground and uh, just give you thoughts to uh, men and women who fought for our country. First one, <clears throat> by General Douglas MacArthur. No man is entitled to the blessings of freedom unless he is vigilant in the preservation of them. <coughs> Another one, John Thorne. I believe our flag is more than just cloth or ink it is the universally recognized symbol that stands for liberty and freedom. 
that's falling away in American history today. It is the history of our nation and it's marked by the blood of those who died defending it. And we have a quite a number throughout our history who died for our freedom. George Patton, it is foolish and wrong to warn the men who mourn the men who died. Rather, we should thank God such men lived. Amen. I love that one. And then one that a lot of you know, the song by Lee Greenwood. And I'm proud to be an American where at least I know I'm free and I won't forget the men who died and gave their life for me. Tamara Bolton, this is the day we pray homage, we pay homage to all those who didn't come home. And this who is and this is not Veterans Day. It's not a celebration. It is a day of solemn contemplation over the cost of freedom. Major Bill Paxton, I hope you know who he is. He is still alive and a wonderful man. <coughs> may, the, may we never forget our fallen, our fallen comrades. Freedom isn't free. And then, of course, the president of the United States in the past, Ronald Reagan. And if words cannot repay the debt we owe these men, surely with our actions, we must strive to keep faith with them and with the vision that led them to battle and to final sacrifice. Another one by General Douglas MacArthur. Duty, honor, country. Those three hallowed words heavenly dictate what you ought to be, what you can be, what you will be. It's good to teach your young children that. Another one by General Douglas MacArthur. No man is entitled to be to the blessings of freedom unless he is, well, we, we studied that one. And then an unknown one. To those in uniform serving today and to those who have served in the past, we honor you today and every day. I just hope that tomorrow, today and tomorrow, you spend a few minutes thinking about over tomorrow our freedom that we enjoy in this country, still enjoy for right now, those that paid the price for our freedom. It was not free. So for that, let's stand and sing together. We'll pay 388. 388. 388. Let's stand and sing together. Am I a soldier of the cross?
Okay, let's uh, talk about wedding, or not wedding, but let's talk about Mary. Not marriage either. Let's talk about prayer. You might have to be in prayer for those other two. <laughs> uh, so, um, any prayer requests that we have? Anybody have? Yes. Um, I have one for the Dags. They're traveling, and Lori asked if we, uh, they're doing Chris's father's memorial service tomorrow. Oh, and just yeah. pray that it, it, you know, that it turns out well, and just pray for Absolutely. And, yeah. Where would I be? It's actually, they're holding it at a camp where he went to as a child, and Chris went to as a child. It's, so it's at a church camp somewhere. Okay. Probably in Indiana, I guess. Very good. Uh, they've just been traveling for the last few days. Thank you. We'll be in prayer. That's a good, appropriate day for it. Good. Yeah. Very good. All right. Any other? Uh, right. Yes, sir. Judith said we should pray for her. <laughs> she said it was her 12th anniversary. <laughs> and she's proud of that? <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. I thank God for her marrying me 12 years ago. It took me several years in my life to finally decide to get married. And uh, then God brought her into my life. And next Sunday is communion. And it just reminded me the last communion uh, caused me to go down. And I'm just so thankful my wife was there beside me and helped me through that. So thank you very much for that time. Any other prayer requests? Yes, sir. A, a family a member of my, my wife's family um, uh, got the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine and now it's got some complications. May, she may have a blood clot somewhere. Uh, she's having troubles with one leg and uh, pains. Uh, so about how old is he? Uh, she, she's she, about 30-something. Uh, she's in her 30s. Okay. Yeah. Wow. We'll be in prayer. Absolutely. Any other prayer requests? Now, let's talk about offering. We've got to be a part of God's plan. This is our joy, our privilege. And we have the young people's class. When's it? Uh, two weeks or three weeks from now? It starts at the end of June? End of June, yes. Yeah. So let's uh, be in prayer and uh, uh, get ready for the, the young people's class uh, here and then our growth here, the outreach. How are we doing? Well, so far we're getting close to back to over 100 countries, but not quite there yet. Okay, thank you. All right, so let's uh, begin with the word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we consider it a privilege and an honor to be a part of the spreading of the gospel of Jesus Christ, sending the message out to young people, to people in the internet, and right here in our own assembly. We pray, Father, you receive the offerings that we're about to give, bring honor and glory to the King of Kings. And to the Lord of Lords, even Jesus Christ, our Savior, in his precious name we pray. Amen. Okay, does everyone have the handout for the omniscience? Uh, of the will of God. Okay? Does everyone have, uh, unless you brought last Sunday, that'd be great, but if not, I uh, printed up at least the part dealing with the, no, the uh, section that we did not have on the mystery, if God permits. So this is where we'll start with the mystery of God permits to remove into our study. So let's begin with our study of the word of God. Very important would be under the power of the Holy Spirit for all that we've got to cover this morning. So let us pray. Your omniscience, Heavenly Father, 
for your will for all mankind for your plan both now and for all eternity we pray Heavenly Father be glorifying to you as we go through this study pray these things in Christ's name and for his sake Amen okay I'm going to like to start in Hebrews 6 again in fact we started with it last week and probably a few more times in different ways so let's take a look at Hebrews chapter 6 beginning at verse 1 therefore leaving the elementary teaching about Christ I want you to think about that leave it leave the elementary teaching about Christ. This is the word of God. This isn't my word. This is his word. Then it continues, let us press on to maturity. Leaving the elementary teaching about Christ, let us press on to maturity. Not laying aside a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God of instruction about washing and laying on the hands and about the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment this is this we will do if God permits some have difficulty with leaving the elementary teachings of Christ and pressing on. This is not my words. This is the word of God. Saying to our leaving the elementary teachings about Christ and pressing on to maturity. Add to that Colossians 1.28 when we proclaim him we proclaim him admonishing every person and teaching every person with all wisdom so that we may represent every person complete complete in Christ now having begun with that let's go into our study on the mystery of God if God permits from last Sunday we took up Roman numeral 1 etymology <clears throat> where we took up several words dealing with the definition understanding coming to 1 Corinthians 4 1 let a man regard us in this manner as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God then Roman numeral 2 the primary use of this Greek word in the New Testament epistles is, is referred to the church age and church age doctrines. Then Roman numeral three, this mystery is now revealed. Then we went to uh, Roman numeral four, mystery is used by Paul to refer to the revelation teachings of the, of the church. We're dealing with the mystery out of our study in Ephesians. Then we went to Roman numeral five. Paul gives a severe warning to those who do not know the mystery as it relates to dispensations. Then we went to Roman numeral six. Another warning to all believers is not to be ignorant or arrogant of your knowing of the mysteries. And that brings us now to Roman numeral 7 in our study. So that's where we'll pick it up now and then taking these others. We're looking at mysteries from our study in Revelation or in Ephesians chapter 1 9. So we move now to major point seven, a good place to see 
a non-doctrinal use of the word mysteries is in Paul's discussion of speaking in tongues. 1 Corinthians 14, 2. For one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands, but in his spirit he speaks mysteries as between you and God. He does not understand, and neither does anyone else his gibbering a mystery. That brings us now, major point eight. The rapture is part of our mystery doctrine. Talk about a mystery, talk about the rapture. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. I make known to you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. Doctrine of resurrection of every believer during the church age at the taking in of the church at the rapture. 2 Corinthians, 2 Thessalonians 2 7. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. That is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is taken out of the way with the removal of the church age. When the church is moved out, that takes out that ministry of the Holy Spirit. Now, he'll be there, but not as he is in the church age. Then Roman numeral 9, Jesus Christ used the term master, uh, mystery. Jesus Christ used the word himself. In the gospel accounts, so we're in the gospel, and remember the gospel is not so much about the mystery, it's about the Old, uh, New Testament. Does not occur in the Old Testament, but hear about Jesus Christ using it. So in the gospel accounts of the same teaching by Jesus Christ, Christ refers to the mystery of the kingdom of God. Matthew 13, 11, Mark 4, 11, Luke 8, 10. These, these Jesus Christ explains to the disciples why he speaks in parables. Parables are not designed to make a message clear. I don't know why it's a lot of people are thinking uh, parables serve, uh, serve for that purpose. It's make it uncare, uh, unclear. They and, uh, just hide or conceal what is hidden, while others, in, in contrast, are given the secret of the kingdom of God. The, the inner secret revealed in the passage is that Jesus Christ himself is identified with the kingdom of God. A secret is being revealed to a specific number. Multitudes today do not know who Jesus is and who he is and is in regard to the kingdom of God. That brings us to major point 10. The Greek word mystery is used in four language, four passages in the book of Revelation. Revelation 1.20 to the mystery of the church in the new age. Then Revelation 10, 7, 17, 5, and 7, where it refers to various mysteries of the tribulation period, where the mystery is to be fulfilled. Point 11, understanding the mystery of the church age absolutely requires 
the filling of the Holy Spirit, the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit, the enlightenment by the Holy Spirit. Let me repeat that. Understanding the mysteries of the church age absolutely requires the filling of the world of the Holy Spirit, the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit, the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit, and our own in our soul and in our time. This is seen in a careful study of First Corinthians chapter two. You have to be very careful. Now pay attention to chapter two. It begins in chapter two in verses one through five, speaking of the gospel. But remember, the gospel is not about the mystery. The gospel has always been revealed in the Old Testament. So when you look at verses 1 through 5, explain the gospel. But now look carefully at verse 7 in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Verse 7, but we speak of God's wisdom. But we change now. We're going to speak now to God's wisdom in a mystery. The hidden which God predestined before the ages to our glory. Now look at verse 10 of 1 Corinthians 2. For to us... God revealed them through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. And remember, of the chapter concentrates on the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Chapter 2 concentrates on the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, look at verse 12. Now, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, the Holy Spirit, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. Mystery of the church age. <laughs> then we close out verse 13 and 14. Look at 1 Corinthians 2.13. Which things mystery doctrine which things we also speak not in words taught by human wisdom but in those taught by the spirit combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words so that we can understand them in our fleshly bodies from the power of the Holy Spirit verse 14 but a natural man, now this refers to unbelievers, but includes every believer who is not filled with the Holy Spirit, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised by the Holy Spirit. Now, only by and in the power, empowerment of the Holy Spirit can you correctly understand the things dealing with the mystery. And now verse 6, 15, but he who is spiritual, he who is spiritual filled with the Holy Spirit, appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. Verse 16, for who has known the mind of Christ that he will instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Now, this is not understood by a lot of preachers, that statement. We have the mind of Christ. So you have to study Isaiah 40, 13 where it's referring to the Holy Spirit, who is the subject matter of all of 1 Corinthians 
chapter 2. Now, having covered mystery, let's move on now, go back to our study. And what we're going to do here, I was working and studying, and I thought, you know, I go through one slow, one word, one word, it'll take hours and hours. We've got to go through the, the uh, blood and all these things we've been studying in in First Corinthians, or in Ephesians, excuse me, Ephesians chapter 1. We go through chapter 1, 2, or verse 1, 2, 3, 4, and we take a long time. I don't want that to happen, especially in verses 9 and following, 9 through 12. So first thing I want you to do is get a feel of First Corinthians, Ephesians, excuse me, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 9 through 12. So let's look. Ephesians 1, 9. He made known to us the mystery of his will. Now those are the things we just looked at. According to his kind intention, which he purchased, which he purposed him with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times. That is the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens, things on earth in him. Also, we have obtained an inheritance accountable to the purpose who works all things after the counsel of his will to the end that we who were the first the first this is the red church age the first to hope in christ this will be done by others later we were the first in the church age would be to the praise of his glory now see i love chapter 9, or verses 9 through 12 in the uh, New American Standard. That, a lot of people get lost by that. So let's do the same reading to the NIV. See if this flows for you better. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purchased in Christ. That pretty much explain, explains itself. He, God, made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purchased in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach, reach their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth and under Christ. To in him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. We'll add that to several times. In order that, and do all of that, in order that, he who is the first in to put our hope, that's the church age, put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. Well, that makes it a little better. Give you one more. This one just makes it even clearer for some, and you'll be able to follow through on it. The Living Bible. God has told us his secret reason. See, right earlier we talked about mystery. So this is going to make it a little uh, different way of making these things known to you. God has told us his secret reason for sending Christ a plan he decided on in mercy 
long ago. And this was his purpose. That, here's the deal, that when the time is right, administration, when the time is right, he will gather us all together from wherever you are in heaven or on earth to be with him in Christ forever. Moreover, because of what Christ has done, we have become gifts to God. That's where predestined came through. That he delights in for, uh, for he delights in. For as part of God's sovereign plan, we were chosen from the beginning to, uh, to be his, and all things happy happen just to just as he decided long ago. God purposed in this was this. So here's the purpose. That we should praise God and give glory to him for doing these mighty things for us. Who's, who were the first to worship, who were to trust in Christ? Now, these are the nine verses here, 9 through 12. We're going to go back over this, well, not every week, but I don't want you to lose these verses and this passage, because where we're going to now take our time. We now got to go to work. So let's look at the next statement. Now, let's go back. You and I go back now with the passage. Go back into this great plan by God for Christ Jesus and for us to be his blessing, to be destined to be the first in glory and glory to glorify Jesus Christ. I want us to stop and just comprehend how important and blessed we are in God's plans before uh, in, uh, to us by Jesus Christ that we're in the mouth studying in these verses. That's just a passage I put together for the, all the verses 9 through 12. They let us now go back into the great plan by God for Jesus Christ and for us to be his blessing, to be destined to be the first in glorifying Jesus Christ. It's a church age. I want you to stop and to think on these things. Now, I put in another word. It's kind of a lot of losing a kid who was doing this and didn't really understand what I was doing and I understand why. So, uh, spend some time in your time in Isaiah 53 on the declaration by God of Jesus Christ for allowing himself to be the guilt offering for us. That's what we're in the midst of studying. Ephesians 1, 9, you may now go to work. He made known to us the mystery, that's what we studied last week and this week, this morning early, to us the mystery of his will. Here's the mystery of his will. We start with a wonderful blessing to his will. Now, we do not have to discover God's revealed will. We do not need to reveal God's will for creation, for mankind. He has already revealed these things 
to us in the Bible. He's already revealed it to us. But you have to study and study it. And it takes wisdom, understanding, and insight to apply it to your life. Fulfill the will of God to mankind and for your own purpose for being here. Many people do not know why they're here on earth. It is the revealed will of God, therefore, we can know the will of God, but then we have to live under that that we know. <clears throat> Acts chapter 20, verse 27, For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. See also Matthew and 1 Thessalonians and 1 Peter. Now, back to Ephesians chapter 1, 9. The mystery of his will, according to his kind intention, which he, God, purchased in him, that is in Jesus Christ. Now we come to the will of God. That's what we've been reading, the mystery of his will. Of course, this could take several hours, months, on study. But we're going to just note a few principles of power going through this will in our study. And then we can move on in our study. Okay. One. These are points dealing with the will of God. One. The will of God starts with Jesus Christ. When you come and study, think about the will of Christ, the will of God, it starts with Jesus Christ. Many people think about and center around the will of God for mankind, actually for themselves. That's, that's what I got to know. No, do not start with God's will for mankind. Do not start with God's will for salvation or sin not even heaven or earth, but the will of God starts with Christ Jesus. That's where we start. Therefore, we go to point two now. The will of God always centers on the essence of God. His will is always based on his holiness and on his righteousness. The will of God always centers on the essence of himself. Three, there is the directive will of God, the permissive will of God, and the overruling will of God. Here is the purpose of your life and your relationship with God the Holy Spirit. We should always be in the power of the Holy Spirit. People, we should be in that every day, all day long. That we live in the directive will of God. We want to be in His power, that we direct and be in His directive will of God, whatever we do. Not everything we do in our lives is the directive will of God. For example, every time we sin, Mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, overt sins. It is not in the directive will of God, but is in the permissive will of God. Now, point four. The will of God and the volition of mankind. The will of God, volition of mankind. This is most difficult for many people, scholars, pastors, a lot of problems here. Many try to make these mutually exclusive. You're either in the will of God or in the whole study and understanding of the volition of mankind. That is, if you have one, 
you cannot have the other. This would take some time. And Calvin, in the study of Calvinism, and Calvin declares that there is no volition of mankind. They have the idea, if you have, give man volition, then you do not have the absolute will of God. That's what Calvinism says. But there are others where man has free will, but where God does not have the free will, the will of God. So they got one way or the other. So which way are we going to go with? But of course, God has given free man free will, man, but man does not have the power to cause things to happen. The sovereignty of God allows man to have free will. But man does not have free will over the sovereignty of God. Any questions on that? A lot of people don't understand that. Let's take up some points into this. One, free will is not equal to or greater than the sovereignty of God. Two, free will is not power as the sovereignty of God is power. There is no glory in free will. Man has free will. There's no glory in it. This is why when you believe in Jesus Christ as Savior, there is no credit or glory to man. All glory is given to the object of faith, that is Jesus Christ. Three, the free will of man does not determine the free will of God. Four, the free will of man does not have the power to counter the free will of God. Five, and if you have any questions on these, raise your hand. Five, the free will of man does not give any glory to man, nor does the free will of man take any glory from God. In fact, the free will, will of man actually attributes glory to God. <clears throat> Six, free will is given to, ma to man by God to demonstrate to Satan. Okay, now this before we change, we've now added to it. Excuse me just a moment. <coughs> Thank you. Free will is given to man by God to demonstrate to Satan that a creature inferior to him, mankind, will use free will to choose for God over Satan. In this sense, man resolves the angelic conflict and glorifies both God and Jesus Christ. And finally, seven, God gave to mankind free will. <clears throat> man is free to use that free will to sin or not sin. Sin came from the free will of man to sin against God. Now, comes to point five. It is the free will of God that all should be saved. But God gives to man free will to choose to believe in Jesus Christ or to refuse to believe in Jesus Christ as Savior. Once a person goes to the eternal lake of fire, this is not because of the will of God, nor by a sovereign decree of God against him. See, Calvin said, God 
These, these are going to go to the lake of fire. These are going to go to heaven. It's not God. God is not destined anyone to go to hell. He's not destined anyone to go to heaven. He's given free will. Now continue. It is by his own man's free will against Jesus Christ. The decree of God takes into account the free will decision against Jesus Christ so that all who rejects Jesus Christ go to the lake of fire. Got that? Every person in the lake of fire is there because they made a decision to use their free will to reject Jesus Christ and make the free will decision to be separated from Christ for all eternity. Now let's go to point six. Why did God create all members of the human race? Why did God do that? Why did God create? Why did God create me? Why did God think of why did God make me? Okay, let's find out. Why did God create all members of the human race? There are several reasons why God created mankind. First, God created mankind to resolve the angelic conflict. For mankind to reveal to Satan that the lower creature mankind would believe in God rather than the higher creature of Satan. Secondly, God created mankind to love the Lord your God. Three, God created mankind to love the Lord Jesus Christ. And then fourth, God created mankind to love your neighbor as yourself. <sighs> Few believers do that. Most believers carry a little arrogance, animosity toward others, jealousy, all kinds of things. A little anger. We don't know how to love one another. We prefer to be hurt. These are the things. But with the power of the Holy Spirit, we can love one another. Makes us point seven. God gave mankind the Bible so that man will know his will in the Word of God. This is the responsibility of every pastor teacher. Acts 20, 27. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. That's what I'm here for, he says, to not back off, not be silent, but declaring the whole purpose. That's what God gave to us in the Bible. The Greek word here refers to not silent, but the whole purpose of God. 1 Thessalonians 4.3 for this is the will of God, your sanctification. That is, that you abstain, abstain from sexual immorality. Now, I'm going to assume most of you know about sexual immorality, what that is. But what about sanctification? You got that down. See? Other, other concepts of sanctification include holiness. Purification, in, complete, in uh, simplicity, be empowered by the Holy Spirit. It is the will of God that we stay in faith in the Holy Spirit. That's how you keep sanctification. It is the will of God in Christ for us that we give thanks to God for everything. Many of people long to know what God is doing here on earth, but have no idea how to learn what it is. Multitudes 
are ignoring how to where how and to where to turn to find out the will of God. They do not know the word of God. And it's getting less and less today, set aside today. Multitudes do not turn to the Bible and study of the word for the truth. <clears throat> the creator of the universe and of all human beings sent them with a detailed instruction book. It explains the design and purpose of all creation from Genesis 1 on. It explains the way to peace and happiness. All this is in the Word of God, the Holy Bible. But many will not allow God's students to teach them that book. For an eight, we can learn, we can know what the will of God is, and we can prove what the will of God is. We can know it and prove it. Romans 12, 1. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, believers, by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God which is your spiritual service of worship and do not be conformed to the world but be transformed by the renewal of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is. That which is good and acceptable and perfect. We must daily transform our minds by the power of the Holy Spirit in the study of the Word of God. We are to spend our day transforming our minds and now nine, is there a reason for your own existence? What is the meaning of your life? <clears throat> Ephesians 1, 9, he made known to us the mystery of his will. God will make known his will. And as you learn the will of God, you become aware of why you're here on earth. Many people live their lives without a clue as to why they're here. Winston Churchill once proclaimed, there is a, a purpose being worked out here below. Talking about World War II. He understood that in some fashion, uh, a supreme being was working out the an unseen and un and little understood plan on earth. But what was it? Churchill didn't know, and he didn't know in real life. Now, let's close this morning. Open your Bibles. Open Open your Bibles. Psalm 139. I am so thankful we have time to close this. Psalm 139. Whenever you become discouraged, bewildered about life, take your Bibles out get alone somewhere and slowly read and study through these 18 verses of the precious Bible. Thoughts from the work, works of Hengstenberg and Cambridge Bible Commentary. Now, first, the omniscience of God 
that God knows everything about you. The omniscience of God, that God knows everything about you. Let's look at verses 1 through 4. Psalm 139. O oh Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You understand my thoughts from afar. You scrutinize my path and my laying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there is a word in my mouth, behold, O oh Lord, you know it all. Then the omnipresence of God. That was the omniscience of God, the all-knowing of all those things. Now we look at omnipresence. Omnipresence. God is always with you, verses 5 through 12. Now what we're going to look at is death cannot hide you. Distance cannot hide you, hide us. Darkness cannot hide. So let's take a look now, verses 5 through 12. You have enclosed me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from you, from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest parts of the sea, even there, even there, your hand will lead me, and your right hand will lay hold of me. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me, and the light around me will be night, even the darkness is not dark to you, and the night is as bright as, bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. Now, God is omnipotent. God is omniscient. God is omnipresent. God is omnipotent. God has wonderful plan for you. Verses 13 through 16. For you formed my inward parts. You warm, warmed me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to him, to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows if you are it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the departs depths of the earth. Your eyes have, have seen my unfold substance and in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me. When as yet there was not one of them that was already formed for me. And if it goes in verses 17, 18, God is constantly where you are in his plans. Verse 17, 18. How precious. Also, 
are your thoughts to me, O God. Study his word. How vast is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would outnumber the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. May God add his blessing to the reading and study of his word. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise you for the God that you are. We pray you for your will. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for revealing your will to us in your word, giving to us the ability through your spirit to live according to your will. That we will be with you forever and ever is such blessing, such peace, such joy. Pray, Father, your spirit could take the things we've seen tonight, this morning. Use these things to our life in Christ. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.